of y'all too. I didn't know about it. Oh, for real? Oh, that would have been fun. Good afternoon, and welcome to the work session for the Griffin Spalding County Schools Board of Education. Today is March 7th, 2003, starting at 4 p.m. Uh, we'll have a call to order by myself, the chair. Please place all communication devices on silent or vibrate. All right. Mr. Chair, if you don't mind, if I can interrupt for one second. You're recognized, I, Just, just because the adoption of the agenda is before the usually prayer and pledge of allegiance, mm -hmm. and I think the word just got left off, and just wanted to see if we can make that change before we actually adopt the agenda. Absolutely. Is there a second? Just add the word prayer to prayer and pledge of allegiance. So we've heard the motion. Is there a second? All right. It's been properly motioned and seconded. Those that are, would like to vote for it, please raise your right hand. Approve 5-0 to amend the agenda to add pledge of allegiance and prayer under item 2. All right. We'll move along to item 2, pledge of allegiance and prayer. We'll go with Mr. Doss and Leader Holmes. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to come and do the business, Lord, of Griffin Spalding County Schools. Lord, we pray for wisdom and direction in all that we do, the presentations that are brought before us, so that, Lord, as we continue to move this system in the best direction and way that it can go. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, thank you so much. We are now at item number three on our agenda. Are we ready now for the adoption of the agenda? What is the pleasure of the board? Thank you so much. Is there a second? Second. It's been properly motioned by Leader Holmes and seconded by the dean of this board, Dean Cook. When your name is called, please respond with your vote. Brown, yes. Cook. McDonald? Yes. Holmes? Yes. Doss? Yes. Approved 5 0. Announcements March 13th through 17th, School Board Appreciation Week. Tuesday, March 21st, is the Board of Education board meeting here in the GSCS boardroom, 216 South 6th Street, Griffin, Georgia, 30224. And also, we want to give a shout out to our Lady Bears of Griffin High School. All righty, ladies and gentlemen, our next item is the consent agenda. What is the pleasure of this body? It's been properly motioned by Leader Holmes to accept the consent agenda as printed. Is there a second? Second. Uh, second by Ms. McDonald of the Formidable Fifth to accept the consent agenda. When your name is called, please respond with your vote. Leader Holmes. Me. Vice Chairman Doss. Yes. Dean Cook. Yes. Ms. McDonald? Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes. Consent agenda approved 5-0. Presentations and discussion. First up, coming from our fine arts department, a music proclamation, Ms. Jennifer Wilson. I don't think that it got turned on. on. You it. may just have to flip the switch on it. There it is. Take two. Here we go. Good evening, Chairman Brown, Board of Education members, and Superintendent Simmons. Music in Our Schools Month began as a single statewide advocacy day and celebration in New York in 1973 and grew over the decades to become a month-long nationwide celebration of school music in 1985. The state of Georgia has formally acknowledged Music in Our Schools Month for the last 38 years. 
The purpose of Music in Our Schools Month is to celebrate and engage music educators, students, and communities from around the country in promoting the benefits of high quality music education programs in schools. So here I have with me um, the proclamation from the governor. This is by the governor of the state of Georgia, a proclamation, Music in Our Schools Month. Whereas music education is part of a well-rounded education for every student, and it shapes the way students understand themselves and the world around them, allowing for a deep engagement with learning. And whereas for more than 30 years, March has been officially designated by the National Association for Music Education as Music in Our Schools Month, encouraging communities across the nation to focus on music education. And whereas the purpose of this celebration is to raise awareness of the lasting positive impact of music education on the academic, personal, and professional growth of Georgia students. And whereas music educators, students, and communities throughout Georgia demonstrate the importance of quality music education programs to the lives of young people. And whereas Music in Our Schools Month reminds us that school is where all children should have access to music. And whereas the state of Georgia joins our music students, educators, and communities in celebrating the power of music education. Now, therefore, I, Brian P. Kemp, governor of the state of Georgia, do hereby proclaim March 2023 as Music in Our Schools Month in Georgia. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Ms. Wilson, if you would join my colleagues up for a photo. Thank you so much, Ms. Wilson. Next up, GSBA District 6 update, Mrs. Amy Dees, the Honorable Amy Dees. Thank you guys for having me. It's always a privilege to get to come and visit and talk to different schools. Hi, Dr. Simmons, how are you? As you, I never have anything to read from because if I did, I wouldn't follow it. Um, I usually just kind of talk from, from the cuff, but I went, have been a school board member in Coweta County for 13 years. Uh, I was elected to serve on the GSBA board. I was appointed to take Sue Brown's seat uh, four years ago and was elected by my peers to serve in that seat two years ago. Um, and I thank you for giving me that opportunity. For those of you that don't know, GSBA, all 180 school districts in the state of Georgia belong to the GSBA, and we are a collaboration of school board members who come together for the purpose of doing what's best for Georgia students. And I can say, having that state level seat for the past several years, Governor Kemp has been the first governor to sit down with school board members. Every year he sits with us in Atlanta. He comes in very early, Governor Kemp likes 6.30 a.m. meetings. And so we are always down very early, but he listens. And I do believe that he's a governor that supports public education. Uh, we are hoping that we can get QBE fully funded or different, it is fully funded now. We are hoping that we will change that formula. There are some house bills that are working on that now. Uh, on February the 21st, I was at the Capitol with Gail. Many of you know Gail and many of you know Paige and the GSBA. We were there advocating for school boards and we are very vocal. And the one thing that I can say to you guys as local school board members, if we do an all call out from that GSBA and we're saying this is a call to action, act. It is so vitally important. We just learned that Senate Bill 233 today, I was having lunch with Mr. Dawson, and Mr. Brown, and we just learned today that Senate Bill 233, the, uh, the voucher bill passed in the Senate. Uh, they did put a clause, a writer, Senator Matt Brass is the author of that bill, and he did, um, I believe it was 25% of failing school districts or those with low test scores will qualify for that. I am never, ever, ever 
a supporter of vouchers. I am a supporter of public education, and I am very outspoken of that when, about that when I'm at the Hill or if I'm with the senators or state representatives. I tell them they were tasked with funding public education. Nowhere in their job description does it say they fund private education. So I am very outspoken and a proponent for public education. Governor Kemp has also been very good to the GSBA. Three of our former school board members are state members across the state, just like yourself. Uh, they have been appointed to the state school board. Nick Ellis is the most recent appointment, good friend of ours, great guy, police officer, former school board member, just got Governor Kemp's appointment to the state school board. I think that is so vitally important for people to know that we actually have school board members and educators going to that state school board because I think it's a lot different than business opportunity and business people on that state school board. Mm -hmm. So I'm very proud of that. Uh, we are crossover day was yesterday. Mm -hmm. Some of these bills are crossing over. Some of them hopefully, uh, most of the vouchers always usually pass into um, the house. Call your house, call your state representatives, call your house representatives, call them, email them, know who they are, and just send an opposition if you're an opposed to the voucher bills. Let them know how you feel about that. Uh, we have many exciting things coming up with GSBA. As you all know, we have the summer conference. A few years ago, Georgia School Board decided to pull away from the NSBA, the National School Board. We did that for many reasons. A lot of people, um, I think, thought was because of the Biden letter. That was not true, if you know what I'm talking about. We did not choose to leave that. I was one of 14 that voted to leave the National School Board. And we voted to do that based on poor management of the NSBA. They were uh, doing some things that we didn't really agree with. So now we've started our own um, individual group called COSPA. And we are going to be meeting in Tampa March 30th. We'll be meeting down there in Tampa to try to figure out what is the new direction as, as school boards? How do we move forward away from the National School Board Association? I can assure you there are solid people in leadership that know way better than I do which direction we need to go on, but I will get on board so that we are moving in the right direction for Georgia students. Um, it is always a privilege to come. I, I can talk to uh, Will Doss. I've spoken to him many times, Sintel Brown. It is always a pleasure. I call them, I text them. I went to Greenville High School, so if any of you know Meriwether County Schools, so I played basketball against Griffin. <laughs> sorry about that. I think we beat you. I'm sorry for you. I, I, th <laughs> I, I think in 1990 we were state champions, but uh, so we played, I, and I was telling Sintel when he was showing me around, I actually played basketball not far from here, so I grew up in Meriwether. My husband graduated from Woodbury High School, so we are local. Uh, I am an author. I write children's books. I write young adult novels. And my recent contract is uh, with New York a Press called Firework Press. And I'm writing five picture books on rarely known African Americans. So that has been a passion of mine to tell African American history prior to the Civil War. So that is my new endeavor because I think as a history writer and a Georgia school board member, we need to know where we've been in order to know where we're going. So that is my passion is public education. In 1990, I was elected to serve with future business leaders of America. Who knows FBLA? So with FBLA, I was the District 6 representative, ironically, represent the same district today as an adult with the GSBA board. I was given Robert's Rules of Order by my dad, who's a commissioner. I was given that when I was 13. So I know Robert's rule of order. So I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud of the things you guys have going on here. I will tell you the day of the tornado, I was in my basement because I'm just down the road in Sonoy. I was praying for you guys. As you all know, we were hit two years ago with an F4. It is devastating. Uh, we, we reached out, was there anything we could do? I think we passed out water bottles right there at the, at the Highway 16 because I know how devastating that was for you all. Um, as far as our update go, I would encourage you as school board members to reach out to your state reps, but only, I, I noticed on your agenda that you guys have a national school board appreciation. I'm gonna talk to you guys for a minute. You may not know how hard it is to be a school board member, but I can tell you, after 13 years in this role, I've had police escorts. 
I've had people come into my board main rooms telling me to ban books. I don't ban books. I write books. They have people, I have people tell, accusing us of things we haven't done. It is the toughest job you can have. And these people sitting here before you willing to serve, hats off to you guys. Uh, with the Georgia School Board Association, we are an association that supports local districts. <clears throat> if there's anything we can do for you guys, I know I reach out to you often. Uh, Miss Sue, I've talked to you several times. I'm so excited when you came on the board as well. So it's good to see you, Miss Cook. As I, I know many of you guys, I think you guys have been on the board. You came on with Centel, so I, I keep track of you guys. I knew when y'all were hiring uh, Dr. Simmons, I think I shot you an email, said welcome aboard. But to know that we are all moving in the right direction for Georgia students, music and arts. I'm a huge advocate for music and arts and education. Uh, we, they asked, uh, this year I was asked to sit on the GEMA board for the Georgia Music Association because they needed a school board to sit on that. If Sintel takes this job, I might do that. <laughs> he, he's not listening to me. Uh, but it is, it is a role that I think that we are all excited to serve Georgia students. I will continue advocating for us at the Capitol. They know who I am. I have many names up there. Some of them are not nice. Uh, I babysat my state senator, so I'm able to get him out when I need to talk to him. Uh, but I think if, we're, if we go about supporting public education in the way we need to, we're doing what's best for students. He's given me the time. He's given me that he wants to get out of here and go. <laughs> but I thank you guys for coming support uh, your local. Appreciate these people next week as we do. Thank you for having me. Thank Mr. you Mr. so much. Leader Holmes, you recognize. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I, I just wanted to ask Ms. Amy, how, how many we, uh, have, have you, uh, I guess, got a uh, firm number or estimate about who's going to be in Tampa? What, what does the numbers look like? We, we are waiting on those numbers. I did ask Valerie what our numbers were. We were talking about that earlier. I am going down. So as soon as I get the confirmation on how many we're going to have Georgia school board members, I'll send it to you guys. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chair, I just have a short question for Ms. Deese. Go Deese ahead, Ms. Ms. Deese, you could approach. Uh, Ms. McDonald, you're recognized. Thank you. What was the vote today for the Senate bill? Uh, was it close or was it? Senate bill 233, it was like 63 to 53, but I will have to look on those numbers. That's it did pass. It's disappointing. <clears throat> thank thank you. you so much. We absolutely appreciate, I think, within uh, since my time on the board, it's the first time that we've had our GSBA director here. So thank you so much for coming with us, and hopefully we'll be able to continue you coming and speaking to us. Thank you so much. Stop it, I say. All righty, next item under presentation discussions, coming from Teaching and Learning, Dr. Audrey Greer. Good <clears throat> afternoon, Chairman Brown, Board, and Superintendent Simmons. Today I will provide you with updates from the Teaching and Learning Department. Of course, we have our non-negotiables, which are to be professional, be accountable, and communicate effectively, as well as our focus areas leads. We have our mission and vision, and here we have our roadmap to success. If you would, please draw your attention to our instructional vision for student success, which reads, we are providing high quality instructional practices where students are engaged in reading, writing, speaking, and solving grade level work and task every day. I am asking you to focus your attention on the instructional vision for student success because today's presentation will highlight our efforts around realizing that vision. The purpose of my presentation today is to provide an update from the Department of Teaching and Learning. The updates will address the RISE initiative, letters, our students' literacy progress in GKids, Orton Gillingham, and MAP, and lastly, our K-12 ELA and K-12 science instructional resources adoption. The district's RISE initiative, which stands for Reading Improvement for Student Excellence, focuses on three areas, including early reading skills, foundational reading skills, and disciplinary liter literacy skills. I will explore each component as we progress through this presentation. Through the RISE initiative, we have developed the GSCS Literacy Advisory Committee with the intention to further literacy awareness across the district. 
As a part of our efforts, we are continuing the Zero to Five initiative by partnering with daycares in the local community to ensure kindergarten readiness. We have also launched letters training in the science of reading for all elementary principals, assistant principals, instructional coaches, and select district staff. We have designated AVID as the district's disciplinary literacy framework, and in doing so, have trained middle school teams and will train high school teams in the summer. Lastly, we have began that research on how to best incorporate literacy instructional strategies by starting our instructional resources and materials adoption for K-12 ELA and K-12 science. The Literacy Advisory Committee has completed several tasks over the course of this school year. We are divided into four subcommittees. The first subcommittee is community. That particular committee has spearheaded the book vending machines as well as Made in Griffin. Our zero to five committee focuses on our GKS readiness. Our foundational literacy committee focuses on letters and Orton-Gillingham or our phonics programs. And then our disciplinary literacy committee is focused on AVID. As you are aware, we started letters at the beginning of the school year. And through this letters training, we have been able to train 40 staff members on what comprehensive literacy, literacy instruction looks like in every classroom. The staff members will continue their professional learning journey throughout the rest of the school year, and as a result, be more equipped to ensure comprehensive literacy instruction in every GSCS classroom. I would like to personally commend all of the letters participants for their hard work. They will conclude volume one in May. They will resume volume two at the start of the next school year. If you take a look at this particular data slide that's presented, here you see our GKIS readiness check data. At first glance, you can easily see that our students' readiness levels have decreased over the years. But I do want to point out that this is the first assessment that students take when they enter kindergarten. It is administered within the first six weeks of school. This data is not indicative of what our students are learning while they are in GSCS, but what it does do is show the need for our partnerships with the local daycares. Our Orton-Gillingham data does show what our students are learning in our GSCS classrooms. If you take a look at this particular data um, component, you see that we are looking at OG proficiency, which is at 80%. We're asking that in order for our students to reach that 80%, that they cover a myriad of skills from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. The blue bar represents assessments that were conducted at, at the beginning of the year in August. The gold, gold bar represents the middle of the year benchmark, which was conducted in January. As you can see, all grade levels, K1 and 2, are making tremendous progress and our most progress is noted at grade kindergarten. We also can see evidence of our work in our MAP data. Just like OG, the students took a beginning of the year assessment in August and a middle of the year assessment in December and January. Taking a look at this data depiction, you can see that the gold bar represents the target for every grade level. The red bar represents the beginning of the year benchmark, and the green bar represents that middle of the year checkpoint. What you will see is that every grade level has shown progress from the beginning of the year to the middle of the year, and some grade levels have even surpassed the goal that we have set for them. So we are definitely seeing some gains with our students' Lexile reading rates based on MAP. Students will take the final MAP assessment for elementary and middle later this month. The last update is around our K-12 ELA and K-12 science instructional materials and resources adoption. Of course, I have presented this information to you all before, and we know that board policy IFAA has provided us guidance 
with how we should conduct the review and adoption process. So following that guidance, we have taken the last few months to examine ELA and science materials. The purpose of our review process was to identify core instructional materials that provide students with grade level learning experience, experiences enhanced over time and that facilitate a deep understanding of the educational content. The goal of this particular resource adoption and resource adoptions to come would be to ensure that our resources align to the content GSE, which are Georgia Standards of Excellence, meet the diverse learning needs of students, foster reading, writing, speaking, and solving daily, which is our instructional vision for student success, and provide a coherent assessment system. That has been our goal and that will continue to be our goal. Since August, we have been participating in this process. We started with the vetting of instructional materials, training our task force members who are representatives from each of our school sites, narrowing down our vendors to preferred vendors list, and even allowing our local community, including classroom teachers, leaders, and the public to weigh in on our resources. When weighing in on our resources, we used an evaluation tool that focused on four categories, including standard alignment, access and equity, assessment, and teacher instructional resources. The results are in. We have had teams from all across the district review ELA and science materials. We even garnered 150 plus comments from our community members, including classroom teachers, building leaders, and other community members. While the review period is closed at this time, you still can take a look at the resources using the bit.ly address that is presented on your screen. The results for K-12 ELA, we have identified a first, second, and third choice for each grade band. For K-2 phonics, we have identified Sattler from phonics to reading, grades three through five, Savis, my view, grades six through eight, HMH into literature, and grades nine through 12, HMH into literature as well. For K-12 science, we have also identified our first, second, third, and fourth choices in some grade levels. For K-5, our first choice, McGraw-Hill Inspire Science. For grades six through eight, Savis Elevate Science. And for grades nine through 12, Savis High School Science. As it relates to the instructional materials and resources review process, my next step is to come back to this board to seek adoption for the preferred vendors. After that adoption is made, then I will also seek approval to purchase materials from those preferred vendors. This concludes my presentation. Do you all have any questions? Board members, Dr. Greer just finished her presentation. Does anybody have any questions at this moment? Just a couple. Ms. McDonald, you recognize. Uh, hi, Dr. Greer. Thank you for being here today. <clears throat> What's the status of the uh, book vending machines? So at this time, the book vending machines have arrived. Oh, cool. They, they have arrived. We are working with our company to provide the books. So when the books arrive, we will be able to place the books inside the book vending machines. And then we will have a reveal for the public. We are anticipating after spring break for that to take place. Okay. And, and one other thing, I know the Instructional Materials and Resources Review, um, I think we're getting back to, these are, these are handheld resources and handheld? They're a combination. We okay. do have some consumable resources that we have examined, but we also have digital resources. Okay. It depends on the grade and the band. I know for K-2, they um, are looking to receive those big books. So those are items that we are not wanting to purchase digitally, but really put it gotcha. in their hands. Okay, thank you so much. Any other questions? Leader Holmes, you recognize? <laughs> thank you, sir. Um, excuse me. <clears throat> Dr. Grill, I, I want to ask, um, how, how do we go about now 
uh, getting books into our schools? How, what, what's the selection process? So the selection process, if you will, I will go back to really my timeline that I had here. We had a wealth of materials that we vetted and using the task force members, we were able to narrow it down from approximately 10 to 12 different vendors to three or four. Those three or four vendors that we narrowed it down to are here. So if we take a look at grades nine through 12, for instance, the three vendors that we narrowed it down to from about 12 were the three vendors that you see on the screen, including HMH into literature, College Board, Spring Board, Savage, my perspective. All of the community members, including teachers and leaders, were able to take a vote. They were able to provide us feedback. And using that feedback, we were able to come away with the first choice, which is what you see here. The next step in this process is for us to work with the vendors to look at price points. I will be able to come back to you all to seek adoption of those materials based on those price points and then later purchase. It is our goal to have um, this process really finalized by the end of April so that we can start planning for integration into our curriculum as well as any training that needs to take place over the summer. So, so if, uh, let's say someone like Mrs. Dees wanted to get her books into our, uh, <laughs> we would hope so. Uh, if an if a independent, I, I know a uh, couple of local uh, authors that have written mm -hmm. uh, children's books and would they have an opportunity or could they you know to get their books in our system so that would be considered a supplemental resource and by all means for supplemental resources they will be able to, to, to use this use another process this process is for tier one core resources and because we have a board policy in place, we would not be able to use an outside company until we go through this process. So if a school wanted to come in and say, you know, I want to use the Green Book series to provide tier one instruction for my K-2, that is not something that we can allow because of board policy. Okay. Well, I, well, I guess I'll just cut through the chase and tell, tell because I've been asked that question, I'll just send them to you and I'll let you uh, do the leg work. Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. All right. Any other questions for any, any members of the body? All right. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Greer. All right. Next up, FY24 budget over your priorities, money back, yo, Mr. Byron Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Cash at, what a, what a cash at. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, board members. <clears throat> uh, what we're about to talk about here briefly is, is our, really our third iteration. Uh, the superintendent gave us a, a vision of, of keeping the budget in front of you, and anytime we do that on a repetitive basis, until like Ms. D says, day 28 on crossover is only a certain amount of information I can share with you. So some of this may seem a little bit repetitive, but I've added a little bit of dialogue in it, and then at the end of this, I'll share, you, share with you what you're about to get ramped up to get here in about three weeks. It'll be a lot more information. So uh, being accountable is the main part of the non-negotiables that we'll be working on with the taxpayer money, the state money, et cetera, as we align our resources. Our mission and vision statement and our uh, roadmap to success, this is our second year of the, or going into our second year for implementation on the, on the roadmap to success. Again, on that bottom line, aligning resources over to the bottom left is a lot of what you hear me talk about on a repetitive basis. Um, just a little bit more detail of what I shared with you last time. Uh, our personnel and operating allotments were provided back uh, from the schools on February 1st uh, or provided to the schools on February 1st and that's a process that we go through to, to uh, see what the schools are actually earning by their FTE counts. The templates by the schools were due back on February 28th. We did grant a few extensions and work with the schools uh, so those have now been returned back to us. And I want, in the second bullet here, I wanted to just explain to you, we're one of about 50 out of 180, 188 school districts that uh, uh, utilizes a concept called 150, Fund 150, and I think this is the third or fourth year here. Uh, there's some cohorts in the state that do this. We're in one of them with like Muskogee County, some, a couple of big ones uh, that do that. And that really is a pooled resource method 
where we combine our Title I funds, our Title II grant funds, and our Title IV funds with an allocation from general fund that's pooled together in the school's budget based on that. So at our bottom bullet where we talk about in just a second their budget meetings, they will be talking about how they plan on expending those resources in Fund 150. So if you are at those meetings, they will be talking about Fund 150. And then how they have some ESSER three money, CARES money, ARP money, we call that, that term interchangeably for one more year that they'll be expending money on that. So you'll hear those terms interchangeably. Um, third bullet, personnel allotments, we based on a ramp formula. That's a resource allocation method formula every year that we follow, that we appropriate, that the schools will earn or be uh, uh, staffed in certain levels based on a certain formula that's been pre-approved. Uh, the QBE formula that, that we base those numbers on, and I, I'm not sure if I've shared this with you or you may know this, it's based on an average of two October counts and one March count. So it's an average of three counts. Normally the October FTE count for the children is a little bit higher than the March, so that the, we're getting the benefit of two higher counts. But I wanted to share that with you when we're always talking about FTE in October and March, et cetera. That's the theory that we go behind in explaining that. Uh, on, the, on the next to the last bullet, we always set aside a little bit of money for the special ed supplies as are needed. We are noticing an increase in the number of uh, children identified with special needs this year. We've done, a, uh, Mr. Kelly's done an analysis on that and shared with the cabinet, so you'll be hearing probably more about that in coming soon. And the budget meetings, which I think you all have received the schedules, those start next week, March 13th, 15th, 21st, and 23rd. Uh, 18 to 20 presentations is what that'll be uh, consisting of, and I believe they're about 55 minutes long. They'll be here in the, in the um, room right up the hall here. So has anybody, as far as that, got any questions? You all got the schedule of that if you choose to attend? Okay. For our departments, again, just to share with you, we, we emailed those out on January 27th, um, and those have also been returned. Uh, we granted a few extensions as well on that. We have department meetings scheduled for individual department directors and coordinators to share with, with my office and some of the cabinet members, full cabinet, um, how they ex plan on expending that in FY24. We, a lot of times you'll hear a term on our second bullet called zero-based. Uh, we ask the departments to go and just go back to bare bones as if they had no money to try to prescribe what they would and see if they come back to the prior year. Uh, revenues and expenditures typically in the government, there's not a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of times you're not earning money. It's a nonprofit organization, so you are tasked with having a balanced budget, so therefore revenues and expenditures in a perfect world uh, should match. You all know we've got a healthy fund balance, so that's because there have been some prior years where we have had more revenue than expense. So we'll talk in a second about how that might turn around just a little bit. So again, those meetings are coming up uh, here soon for the departments. <clears throat> we've talked about this over and over again, and, and Dr. Simmons and I were actually talking about that this morning, of how many years there's been an FTE decrease in Griffin Spalding, way, way before Mr. Jones got here. But we're hoping soon that we're going to bottom out with that. Uh, again, as I've told you, about $5,000 a child, roughly $4,500 to $5,500 a child. Anytime we lose a child, that's what we're losing on FTE money. So uh, because we're basing it, because our, our number is based on three counts, we may lose again for this coming year. But hopefully at that point, we're going to be at a break even for the 25 year. Hopefully we won't lose any based on that next three year average. So. Uh, just don't want you to be conflicted if you get some attendance data or some enrollment and it looks like we've gone up. This, this counts based on a, an average. We've talked before about the tornado damage. I, I, we've been monitoring the enrollment and, and I don't know that we've lost that many children when we're looking at that now. That, that, I mean, as before January 12th compared to now, that have come back and they've been identified of where they're at if they're out of district. But we do have to keep that in mind. Um, if they choose not to re-enroll in the summer, et cetera, or where they will be located, I'm just identifying that that could impact bus transportation or McKinney-Bento, et cetera, if we have to go and bus outside of our normal zones to bring the children back to Griffin Spalding. Um, legislative session so far, uh, I didn't see a lot about this last night when they hit the gavel, but I, from what I know, it's still a $2,000 being talking about for the state teacher salary scale. And you all know that if, if that goes through that has an impact for, uh, we'll get funded for the teachers that we earn, but if we employ more than we earn, then we're, the local money's on the hook for that 2,000 and the benefit matches that go along with that. 
So if we earn 700 teachers and we employ 705, then we are on the hook for the five. So just want to identify, we'll talk more about that in, in the tentative budget presentation. The state health employer increase, again, there's, there's been conflicting information about this, and I, I had to turn this into Dr. Simmons before last night. This was due last third, or Tuesday, I think, to Ms. Ray. I think there's some more conflicting information about it. there might be some phase in on some of these set health benefit increases. And remember I told you last, last month there's a difference in the certified and the classified. So to reiterate, if it's an, if it's an employee in the 700 that we earn, we're getting a benefit match contribution from the state on that person if they choose the health insurance. Anybody in addition to that, we don't get any match on that from the state. And we're not really getting many matches on it for the classified employees. That's pretty much all in the local district. So I'll give, hopefully by the time we meet again, we will have this nailed down on what the impact to the district is on the benefit match. I already mentioned to you about the second year, the roadmap to success. Uh, inflation, we can talk about that all day, but that is going to, you know, we just talked about some of that here with personnel costs and our materials and supplies, bus fuel, insurance. Uh, some of our material costs with books and supplies may, may also go up. We always talk to you about longevity step for employees. I put a million dollars on here. It's normally around 800,000. Um, but again, if, if, if there's some other kind of raise involved, it might go coincide with the longevity steps. It may be closer to a million. Um, everybody remembers I've been beat you over the head about we've got to pull the, the salaries back into the general fund this year. So for Multiple years we've been able to defer salaries for principals and APs and a few uh, central office positions to our CARES II grant. So that's approximately six and a half million dollars. That's another reason, again, when we had our millage hearings in the past couple of years and our fund balance has been elevated because we knew we were going to have to pull that back in. So just remember that when we get to that point, we really don't have a choice on that. Um, I wanted to mention this last bullet here. Uh, you all have already approved the, the outsourcing of the substitute staff and service. Just wanted to, to identify, Ms. Battle knew, knew I was going to say this, that could come at a cost to us, but we, we know that. We're saving money right now because we can't get subs. So we're saving money, but we're not really benefiting as a school district. We're just saving money in the fund balance, but we, don't, we can't adequately staff the, the, for when the teachers are out. So we're hoping, and, and Judy has shared some good data the other day about new subs that's already been recruited. Just want to identify that could come at a cost for us next year because anytime you outsource, it comes at a cost. But we think we'll be able to provide more, more services for the schools based on that staffing service. Are we so. the My opinion is yes. I don't, I don't know if Judy have something to add to that, but yeah, I mean, it's, she's been meeting uh, and can tell you some detail on what they've been meeting about. Yes, I, um, good evening. I do believe benefit for using a third party for subs. Um, already they have um, 104 brand new substitutes to the pool. Um, and we've already transitioned over 124 legacies. So we're getting them on the roll and getting them started. I think in terms of filling vacancies, we will see the benefit there. Um, again, the frequency, they'll get paid every week. That will encourage longevity. Maybe they'll stay with us a little bit longer. Um, and also they can enroll in benefits. So I, I think this will prove to be beneficial not only to the substitute, but to our school district. <coughs> yes. All right, again, uh, next steps again. Uh, the superintendent's office and several of us have got, we've already put on the calendar about four strategic meetings coming up before we present the strategic budget where we will, I mean the intended budget, where we'll be establishing some more of his distinct priorities. We will also present to you district fund categories. What I mean by that again, you'll, you'll get the normal stuff from me for general fund, special revenue, debt service, capital projects and nutrition in a distinct format that you're used to seeing. I talked about this earlier, but I want to identify it again, the finalization of feedback from legislative session. So, so again, we're doing, we're, our goal is to give you a final budget for you to vote yes on, I think it's May 16th. Most school districts are voting on their final budget in late June. That was, that was the superintendent wants us done with that in May. So again, by doing that, I'm gonna give you a tentative budget on April 11th. You're gonna get it before because you gotta be prepared for the board meeting. 
there could be changes between tentative and final budget because of the timing of you getting so much stuff so earlier. So just know that tentative budget, you, you by law have to adopt that. We have to run it in the legal organ newspaper. You can then change that for the final budget. And so that is normal in a lot of school districts. So there's been times that it has matched here, the tentative and the final, but it could be different. Uh, and then any unmet school uh, school request, we will be looking at that in our budget meetings with the schools and analyzing what remaining ESSER 3 or American Rescue Plan funds we still have. Again, that'll play out over the next two weeks. Uh, in bold is uh, the next time you will get something from me. We're not planning on a formal presentation at the March 21st BOE meeting. That was strategic for us to keep this on the work sessions. I will be up here presenting the February financial report and I will ask you after that, do you have any questions about the process that we've talked about three times in a row now? Or if there's anything you need for us to be looking at for our, before we finalize the budget book, you will then receive that. Uh, we'll work with Ms. Ray's office to make sure you receive that right around before we go out for spring break. Um, and then when you come back for the, the meeting on April the 11th, what we want you to have prior to that meeting is a PowerPoint of probably of some graphs for the public hearing. Then we'll go into the board meeting at 6 o'clock. You will have a full tentative budget presentation, a PowerPoint, and your budget book. You're gonna get, you should get all of that prior, like on the March 31st date, prior to the meeting. And then, so again, public hearing on that same day. We'll have to make sure that's advertised. And then the 18th, the 18th is, is going to be a called meeting to vote on the, the tentative budget. Okay, so that's not in your published calendar right now with a public hearing. And then you can see May 2nd, May 16th, and then we'll uh, put it on our website on May 17th. So has anybody got any questions uh, based on that? All right, board members, looks like there are no questions. Thank you, Mr. Jones. All right, information items that we have. Workers' compensation fully insured. Metal detectors for high schools, LED marquee signs, and bus purchases. Is there anybody for board member comments? None? Okay. All right, we do have executive session, and the board will go into executive session for two reasons. One is to discuss and deliberate upon employment of personnel and the other one is to vote or to discuss authorized negotiations uh, for purchase or lease of property. Is there a uh, motion for executive session? So moved. All right, it has been properly moved by Mr. Doss of the second and seconded by Mr. Holmes of the third. All those in favor, vote by raising your right hand. Five zero. Oh. The board is in executive session. If, if there's anyone who is interested in uh, sending off the Lady Bears, Mr. P will make an announcement. He's our Director of Communications. I'll hold the microphone for you. 530 Griffin High School bus ramp tonight, this evening. So if anybody wants to go over there and wave and clap for the Lady Bears going to the state championship, 530 Griffin High bus ramp. Awesome. 